Let's continue with the reading of Dr. Abbas Bundu's book, guys. Including such perks as free cars and free housing, domestic servants, and so on. Abbas Bundu, they went to parliament in 2018. They were asking for an increment in salaries. This man here would rub allowance, all kinds of allowances. These guys, these guys, they, you know, you know, it is sad. It's one thing if you don't know. It's another thing when you know. But you dangled in the same mess. You brought no impact. You made no change. You did not improve the lives of Sierra Leoneans. Nothing. That is what is sad when it comes to people like Abbas Bundu, guys. This is the reality that I want you guys to see and I want you guys to understand so that we can all be on the same page. But this is terrible. These guys know. Let's continue to read. Let's continue to read. All right. The incumbents expect to make it a little bigger. Move Abbas Bundu's photo over there. Move this up there. All right. So the incumbents expect to earn big salaries, including such perks as free cars and free housing, domestic servants, and so on. On top of this are the earnings possible mostly through the award of contracts or the grants of license. So public office holding is, a, is coveted as a major way by which leaders, politicians, public and civil servants alike can escape from the poverty trap or from other or from their otherwise marginal economic and social existence in an environment of declining opportunities and prospects. Little wonder that ruling parties everywhere often experience, albeit in varying degrees, internal convulsions as party stalwarts compete either to attain or to retain the limited number of coveted positions available. That's what is actually happening in all of these political parties, especially right now, the APC, as you guys can see, everybody's fighting for these positions within the party. That is what Abbas Bono is talking about here. Now, Ruth first has described how Nigeria's first republic became an orgy of power being turned to profit. Sanya Bacha plundered Nigeria during his nearly five years in power before his abrupt death in June 1998, with such single-minded zeal that Western officials estimate that he may have had more than $3 billion stashed away in overseas bank accounts, equivalent to what it took Mabutu of Zaire more than three decades to amass. In Ghana, Dr. Kofi Buswa admitted whilst he was prime minister that there is not a single honest person in his cabinet, in my cabinet. In Cote d'Ivoire, Cohen has shown how the political administrative class has managed to obtain a disproportionate share of urban resources such as land, housing, education, jobs, and social services. In the Central African Republic, apart from his huge personal wealth, Emperor Jean Bokassa's extravagant coronation in 1977 alone cost 12 million francs in a country where total revenues were not more than 14 million francs. Politics in Africa has thus come to be seen as sleaze-reading and undemocratic. The major difference... The major difference with the developed world being that in Africa, sleaze is perhaps more visible because of the depth and extent of poverty and deprivation. Sierra Leone is not different, except that the conflict has made it smell to high heaven. I wonder why, you know, Abbas Bundu did not talk about Milton Magai and Albert Magai. He mentioned all these other African leaders, guys. I don't know why he didn't mention Albert Magai, especially Albert Magai, who engaged in nepotism, tri tribalism, corruption at the highest levels, driving the most expensive vehicle. I mean, back then, driving a limousine was a... I don't know why he did not mention Albert Magai. And, you know, but this is how corrupt these guys are. Because he's SLPP. Anyways, let me continue to read. I don't want to do any interpretations right now. This conflict is not between ordinary folks as much as between and within the political elites. 
This partly explains why personal rivalry within the ruling elite, as well as between rival political parties, has grown fiercer. It's very fierce, the competition. You see what's happening, right? Everybody's out to get everybody. And why the tendency to besmirch the character and reputation of the opposition has written to unprecedented levels. Again, this was in 2001, Abbas Bundu. And they write so, and everything that is happening now, so you're listening to this, and look at what is happening now. He oversaw a parliament that is the most corrupt, that would go down in the books of history as the most nasty parliament Sierra Leone has ever had. This Abbas Bundu. But he's telling us back then he knew about how they went after our opposition. Let me read this again. I want you guys to catch it. Rivalry within, again, let me go back here, right here. This partly explains why personal rivalry within the ruling elite as well as between rival political parties has grown fiercer and why the tendency to besmirch the character and reputation of the opposition has risen to unprecedented levels. So commonplace has it become that the ordinary man sometimes disarmingly dismisses it as politics. Often, the rivalry is fiercest amongst politicians for whom politics is the be-all and end-all. What do we have in Sierra Leone today? Every one of these guys, without politics, they are empty, including Abbas Bundu. Without politics, they are empty because they are corrupt individuals. Nobody's going to give them jobs. They would not be able to steal the amount of money that they are stealing from the people of Sierra Leone today, any place else, but through politics. That is why politics is the be-all and end-all. Abbas Bodo knows these things. Let's continue. The mindless rivalry in Sierra Leone. Excuse me. The mindless rivalry in Sierra Leone may also be seen as the function of a decrepit economy. So long as the government dominates the dispensation of goods and services and the distribution of legacy that they're giving out, the government, as long as the government is in charge of, you know, everybody gets their own court, everybody, as long as the government is controlled, little is likely to change in the system of patronage. What do we have today? Uh, guys, I really don't want to interpret, do any interpretation. I just want to read. But it's so hard for, not, for me not to just, you know, break in a little bit and, you know. I'm going to resist the urge to interpret this. I'm just going to read, guys. I'm just going to read. I hope you guys understand what I'm reading. Because you'd have time again after the live to go back and listen and understand. That's why I'm taking my time to call out the words one after the other. All right? Let's continue reading. The mindless rivalry in Sierra Leone may also be seen as the function of a decrepit economy. So long as the government dominates the dispensation of goods and services and the distribution of legacy, little is likely to change in the system of patronage. Incumbents see themselves as enjoying their turn at the expense of the opposition and the nation as a whole. Hey, salud. Sometimes, even to the extent of officializing political victimization, it is an official thing to for, for, for politically victimize the opposition. Clients reciprocate the benefits they receive from their patrons with tangible and intangible assets. This include strident demonstrations of allegiance and esteem, gathering of so-called intelligence, but often scurrilous information about the patrons, about the patrons perceived political enemies and partisan support, which you see between Salon people and so like it today, SLPP supporters, they are in. And once then they get their breadcrumbs underneath the table, right? Where ethnic rivalry is at stake, ethnic loyalty often resonates with the followership and the leadership in turn exploits it to further its own ends. In this exploitation of ethnic differences to obtain otherwise unattainable goals that constitutes the most pernicious and unacceptable form of tribalism in African politics. Hey God. Unfortunately, tribal demagoguery 
still infests the body politics in Sierra Leone. Remember, Abbas Bondo, this was in 2001 when he was writing all of these guys. This is not even right now, but it's like he's writing it right now. But he's part of it. That's the difference this time. He's part of it. He oversaw the destruction of our democracy. Let me continue reading. Unfortunately, tribal demagoguery still infests the body politic in Sierra Leone. It peaked after February 1998, following the return of the government of President Kaba and the demise of Air Farsi rule. You see, he skipped all of the Albert Magai era in Otokunati Neyoto. Maybe, and see, we're all reading this book together. Maybe. It will talk about what Albert Magai did between 1964 to 68. But it did not mention that all. You know, the city corruption of these guys. Maybe, maybe, as we go in the book, we'll find that. Because I'm reading this book in real time to you with you guys. I have not read this book before. I just bought it. It came the other day. I'm like I said, I'm going to read this book with you all. As you can see, if you're just joining me, this is the book. Fabas Bund right here. This is the book. All right? So let's continue reading. Unfortunately, tribal demagoguery in, still infests the body politics in Sierra Leone. It peaked after February 1998, following the return of government of President Kaba and the demise of Air France in rule. Even though the RUF is not of Northern origin, though led by a man with a Northern name, Furisanko, we're not going to talk Ali Kaba yet. Let's see, maybe along the line, Ali Kaba would pop up in this, what Furisanko if you guys remember, Marabio's sister who passed, that was buried in Bonth, I heard APC parliamentarians actually attended that funeral. So um, Marabio's sister was the wife of Furi Sanko. But anyways, let's, let's read this. This is getting interesting, guys. This is getting interesting. Stay, stay with me. Even though the RUF is not of Northern origin, though led, I'm, I'm happy he said it's not of Northern origin. The RUF is not of Northern origin, means it did not start in the North. I like that. It was honest with that. Though led by a man with a Northern name, Furisanko, and even though the North suffered the worst carnage in the hands of the RUF, President Kaba did not hesitate to blame Northerners in 1996. If only to clear the air once and for all and avoid future recriminations, it is vitally important that the true story of the origins of the RUF be told. So let's see. I think Dr. Abbas Bundu is going to tell us the real story of the RUF, the formation of the RUF. Let's see what, we, what he got for us. See? Split within the SLPP. That's the other title there, right? As you guys can see, this is beautiful, man. This is beautiful. All right. The death Oh, now we're going into the SLPP. <sighs> man, this is getting interesting. This is beautiful. The death of Sir Milton in April 1964 led to a serious split in the SLPP over the issue of succession. That's very crucial. Let's talk about that. The two leading contenders, Albert Magai and John Kerifa Smart, were both from the South. The former was a wily politician from Bonth District, that is, um, Albert Magai. Uh, Karifa Smart, sorry. Whilst the latter from Rotifunk in Moyamba District, Karifa, was generally perceived as a principled technocrat committed to playing the political game solely by the rules. Perhaps because of this, he lost the party leadership to Magai, that is, John Karifa Smart. against the protestation of 35 members of parliament. So Karifa Smart was actually the one, because he was the minister of finance at the time, but I don't want to beat the gun on this book. Let's read this book together. Let's read the book. Guys, let's read the book together. I don't want to beat the gun. The former was a wily politician from Bonth District, while the latter from Roti Funk in Moyamba District was generally perceived as a principal technocrat committed to playing the political game solely by the rules. That is, Karifa Smart. Perhaps because of this, he lost the party leadership to Bagai. Against the protestation of 35 members of parliament, including three ministers, the governor-general appointed Albert Magai as prime minister. However, 
many believed that powerful Creole friends of Magai, in a position to advise the governor general, had twisted his arm into appointing him. An unprecedented level of financial sleaze and cronyism marred Halbert's rule. So also the tribalism as he slanted the SLPP towards the south and particularly his Mende, Keith, and Keen. This blatant tribalism, which had played a crucial factor in his succession, was, the cost, was to cost him the general election of 1967. Oh, Abbas Bundu, very honest, very honest. And it also carried a particular poignancy to the events that immediately followed as Shaka Stevens recalled. This is Shaka Stevens now in quote. So again, just in case you guys missed this, I want to read this part again for you. An unprecedented level of financial sleaze and cronyism marred Albert's rule. Guys, Albert Magai's legacy was the, the unprecedented level of financial sleaze. If I just say financial corruption, no use sleaze. And cronyism marred Albert's rule. So Albert Magai's rule was just corruption. Cronyism, tribalism, nepotism, everything. So also the tribalism as he slanted the SLPP towards the south and particularly his Mende, Keith, and Kin. This blatant tribalism, which had played a crucial factor in his succession, was to cost him the general election of 1967. And it also carried a particular poignancy to the events that eventually followed as Shaka Stevens recalled. This is what Shaka Stevens said. While stuffing his henchmen into the power centers of politics, he was cramming every vacancy in the civil service and armed forces with fellow tribesmen. Magai's retreat into a tribalism more divisive and a sectionalism more acute than any previously practiced, even by the SLPP, was the worst thing that had happened to Sierra Leone since independence. Guys, I want you all to pay attention to this. You okay, Gabriel? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading something here. Let me focus on that, okay? All right. Guys, I'm going to read this again. You guys think we're making up the stuff about Albert Magai and the SLPP and how Sierra Leone was destroyed till that day, up till this day. The Marabio came. They are implementing the Albert Magai principle, and that is why Sierra Leone's democracy is dead. That's why we don't have democracy. Let me read this again. This was a quote from Sheka Stevens. As reported by Abbas Bundu. While stuffing his henchmen into the power centers of politics, he was cramming every vacancy in the civil service and armed forces with fellow tribesmen. Do you guys see that today? Is that what is happening today? Magai's retreat into a tribalism more divisive and a sectionalism more acute. Tribalism, sectionalism. All right, you see what you want to talk? Than any previously practiced, even by the SLPP, was the worst thing that had happened to Sierra Leone's since independence. When we needed unity most, Magai set us at each other's throats. When we most needed to set tribalism aside, Magai exploited it with a frantic ruthlessness. When we were striving for equality, Magai made a cult of discrimination. There were two good reasons, good from his point of view, for this policy. By enlivening Inter-tribal tensions, he hoped to activate Mende sentiment into his own cause so that he could use it to keep power. However, the election went for precisely the same reason. The Creoles, whose support had been a key factor in Albert's succession, turned against him when the elections came. According to Cartwright, the Creoles originally sympathetic turned against him because of his apparent favoring of Mendes, his self-enrichment, and his attempt to cut away legal safeguards they saw as necessary to protect their position. What is happening today? Let me read that again. The Creoles, originally sympathetic, turned against Albert Magai because of his apparent favoring of Mendes, his self-enrichment, 
and his attempt to cut away legal safeguards they saw as necessary to protect their position. And the, the Creole people that they be supported by my guy, but the governor general appoints him instead of Karifa Smart. Do you guys understand this? But they turn against them in the 1967 elections. That is why you see in the Haras Mayor Ivraki Soya. Let's continue. Northerners' initial suspicion of one Mende succeeding another were heightened. You see how the tribalism began our country? This was how tribalism started in Sierra Leone. And the SLPP Marabio came and heightened them again after former President Kroma lowered the tension in the country. So again, let's go back. Northerners' initial suspicion of one Mende succeeding another were heightened by what they interpreted as tribal biases in appointing Mendes to key civil service posts. Building here ports near Sir Albert, Albert's home in Mende land and using Northern chiefs against their people to keep the Mende SLPP in power. What do you guys see today in Sierra Leone? But that is not what I'm doing here. I want to read. Let's just read, guys. I'm just going to read. I know you are seeing everything I'm saying. Let's just read. I just want to read. I just want to read. Ethnicism and cronyism thus soiled Albert's records of leadership. That was not all. Step by step, Albert showed himself as a leader who was determined to strangulate multi-party democracy right from the start. This plan was laid bare by his enactment of the Public Order Act 1965. The Preventive Detention Act, 1965. Are you guys taking note? The Preventive Detention Act, 1965, and the introduction of the 30-day absenteeism rule on 4 May, 1965. That's when you're upset for 30 days, you lost your position again, you go detain your position. Guys, 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 let us read. I just want to read. This is beautiful. This is fantastic. Thank you, Abbas Bundu. Let me go back. This plan was laid bare by his enactment of the Public Order Act 1965, where SLP is still a used to be. Public Order Act cannot process. Procession, no. You, 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 you're causing dismay and, and, and confusion in the public. You cannot protest. 1965 Public Order Act, they're still talking about it. Even though we have the 1991 Constitution, they're talking about it. But let me read, guys. Let's read. Let's read. What time is it? 7.33. Oh, my God. Time is gone. Let's read. Let's read. I think when I'm done with this page, I'll stop it there and then we'll continue tomorrow. But let me read. Let's read, guys. Stay with me. Stay with me. Focus, everybody. Focus. Stay with me. This plan was laid bare by his enactment of the Public Order Act 1965, the Preventive Detention Act 1965, and introduction of the 30-day absenteeism rule on 4 May 1965 to deprive parliamentarians of their seats if, if absent for 30 sitting days. Not only were four APC opposition members of parliament deprived of their seats under this rule while in prison on trumped-up charges. Hey, Godfather. The party was prevented from holding legitimate political meetings in the rural areas where its rising popularity was proving unstoppable. Guys, follow me. Stay with me. Karifa Smart too suffered a similar fate. In fact... It was popularly believed that that rule had been passed specifically for him. It was deprived by his parliamentary seat following. It was deprived of his parliamentary seat following his acceptance of a lectureship at Columbia University in New York. His teaching commitments had made it impracticable for him to attend all parliamentary sessions in Sierra Leone. So he quickly fell foul of the 30-day rule. He was to fall victim to this law for the second time, 35 years later, when the SLPP government, this time under Kaba's leadership, used it again to deprive him of his parliamentary seat in July 2000. It was further de denied and it was further denied the title and status of 
parliamentary minority leader, even though his party, the United National People's Party, UNPP, had won the second largest number of seats in parliament in the parliamentary election of 1996. The SLPP of Tijan Kaba deprived Karifa Smart for, for him to become the leader of the minority, even though he won more parliamentary seats. The same thing that APC Cherikoko bargained with the SLPP for in 2018 because he was going to lose his seat because he was one of those that was petitioned. But he sold his minority leadership too, as for, for him to become a speaker. He sold it to um, a speakership, sorry, not his minority, minority leadership. The, the, he sold his leadership for him to become the speaker in parliament to the SLPP because he was subpoenaed and, you know, um, uh, by the SLPP. For him to lose his seat, I think that was the bragging that he made. Say, okay, we'll keep you because he contested against Bio's nephew, so we'll keep you in parliament, but you have to give up the speakership. And that was how Abbas Muni became speaker. Guys, I hope you guys are understanding this. But you see the precedent that Albert Magai set. So this started again. Even Tijan Kaba did the same thing. 